we've been packing them in to these webinars. We've had sometimes five presenters, uh, but it's it is quite nice on our last one to have uh, two top guns and two people that I admire. Um, we have Paul Ward. Hi, Paul. Kia ora. Nice to have you with us. And James Wilcox also. Um, hi, James. Kia ora. Um, uh, Paul is from Capital Kiwi and James is from Predator Free Wellington. And um, they're both going to present tonight. And any questions that you might have for them, what we're going to do is you can put them in the chat box there where Lynn said hi. And then at the end, we will ask any of those questions to both of them. We'll put them both back on the screen uh, after the presentations that they have for you tonight. And uh, and then we will um, get your questions to them answered, which is going to be fabulous. And couldn't have two better lads. Uh, I'm going to, though, get rid of one of them to what we call the green room where they can watch. So I think, James, we're sending you away for a sec. Uh, we'll see you back in probably about 15 minutes. And that leaves you, Paul. Can you introduce yourself to people who don't know you um, and uh, uh, and your um, your project, just which is pretty well known, actually, to be honest, of uh, of Capital Kiwi? But can you just do a reintroduction for us? Awesome, absolutely, Nick. So, um, yeah, na mihi o te po, um, ko Paul Ward tōku ino, and I'm the uh, the um, founder and, and the project lead for the Capital Kiwi project, and and it's the um, in short, it's the, it's the mission to restore a large scale wild population of kiwi uh, to the backyard of Wellington City. You've been getting a lot of um, good publicity, I, you know, popping up left, front, centre. Have you been? Enjoying that? I mean, the rest of the country's watching you, really, aren't they? Well, we're both um, uh, very stoked, <laughs> first and foremost, <laughs> uh, at, at, the, at welcoming. There's 63 Kiwi out there now on the Western Hills, uh, and, and they're going well. Uh, we're also uh, we're also pretty tired, <laughs> um, and this is probably the last of, uh, uh, on May the 9th and May the 16th, we welcomed um, uh, 50 Kiwi. Uh, to come home to those yep. western hills and it's um one of the largest if not the largest uh, uh translocations of kiwi that have been done so so there's a few things that uh we've been learning on route as, as a team and as a community so things like driving for for seven hours from mangatauteri down state highway one and um uh, one of one of our drivers said there's probably no better way to be present uh than to be driving a van load of taonga down uh um <laughs> down a dark road and you know eyes on every pothole and, and all that kind of thing so yeah we're um um but pretty very stoked there's you know for the first time in in roughly 150 or so years there's uh, kiwi calling in the wild from from those western hills wow yeah incredible um i'm going to put you over here with me into the smaller box area and i'm going to go to your presentation so we can get underway and you can tell us all about what you are doing for those who may not know enough about it. So away you go. It's all yours. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. So I thought probably before um, leaping into a, to a, a quick whistle-stop tour through the um, five years of the project, um, it was worth outlining for people um, a, a kind of basically what Kiwi conservation involves. Um, they, uh, like many of our, our manu, um, were and are vulnerable to, to the in introduced predators that, uh, that we brought, that people brought with us um, to Aotearoa. Um, but Kiwi in particular have, have quite a few things going for them um, that are probably worth just uh, uh, walking through before we dive into the, the speech. So, so they've got an egg that's so big that a, that a rat or a stoat can't get its mouth open enough to put a hole in it. So, so they've got a tick at that end of um, um, their uh, design features in terms of resilience. An adult kiwi, and I might just skip through to a picture of Anahira for a look on the slides. Um, an adult kiwi, here we go. Um, an adult brown kiwi can get up to three, three and a half kilos. They've got big fighting claws and they exhibit a bunch of, um, of, of features like, you know, they're tough, they're adaptable, they're resilient. Um, and they can fight off pretty much all comers, st um, stoats, possums, cats. Um, really, the, the only two issues for adult kiwis are roaming dogs and ferrets, which we currently don't have uh, in the Wellington region. So where kiwi get um, are vulnerable is predation on the chicks before they get up to that fighting weight. And it, and it wasn't really until the 80s and 90s when they were able to get transmitters on chicks and later trail cameras 
that they understood what was happening to our our you know national symbol in in, in Taonga. And there were many areas where because they can an adult Kiwi can live for a very long time, so so 40, 50, 60 years, um, they thought Kiwi were doing okay. But what what they started to understand uh, was that was was happening was once those adult birds died, there were no birds replacing them. So so Kiwi populations were very slowly heading towards extinction. And um, once they understood that what was happening, we understood what the conservation challenge was for us as a as, as a people. Um, and that that was to um, either r remove uh, the chicks from those pressures or or deal to those pressures uh, in situ by removing the predators. So um, five years ago, and what we know um, from countless examples, not countless, but many examples around the country is that where we do that work, we can have growing Kiwi populations. So um, five years ago, based on um, the resurgence of uh, Manu to Wellington, um, we decided to get on with, with um, the returning Kiwi. And the proposition was, if Wellington's hills can be the home of Kiwi, then they should be the home of Kiwi. And um, and we took that proposition out to uh, to hang on I'll go through to um, our big map um, to uh, farm kitchens, wool sheds, uh, marae, um, village halls, churches, um, pubs, and had conversations over over craft beer, over flat whites um, about whether people uh, landowners, iwi mana whenua. Uh, locals, uh, particular in, in Makara and Oharu Valley, were, were keen on supporting this proposition, and and you, the agreement was uh, was near unanimous. And so at that point, it was well. Then it's our duty really to get on with it. Um, and the getting on with it, as as you'll see on the screen, uh, is four and a half thousand traps over nearly um, twenty four thousand hectares. So for comparison, um, it's rough, a little bit bigger than Abel Tasman National Park. Um, and it's the largest community-owned stoke trap network in the country. And half of that network, the, the red bits you can see, are looked after by the Capital Kiwi team. And those yellow dots that you can see, which are each, each uh, are traps, um, are looked after by community groups and uh, regional council and the city council. So down the bottom there by Parifero, by Red Rocks, you've got the four-wheel drivers um, looking after about 1,000 hectares of Te Kopaho. Uh, west of Karori, you've got um, the mountain bikers looking after um, after Makara Peak. And, um, yeah, all those volunteer groups, those predator-free groups throughout Wellington, um, pest-free South Makara, um, all the way through that um, that town belt up to uh, Whiriraa and Tawa uh, and those hills behind Porirua. Um, and I guess the point we want to make is that the, these aren't just dots on a map but a, but a network of relationships. And it's not council or doc telling people to do this, uh, but voluntary and willing. And one of the things we we recognise to begin with, and Nick, you, you know, you, you know the projects that I've been involved in to begin with, like Waimapihi and Pol, uh, previously Pole Hill. Yeah, and, yep. and it was recognising that um, to look after a wide-ranging bird's manu, like kiwi, uh, like kiriru, like tui, like kāriria, like kāka, we can't do it in bits and bobs because... These birds, these taonga don't respect property boundaries and neither do the pests that threaten them. And so if we're going to look after these birds, we need to do it at landscape scale. We need to do it together. We need to do it working with mana whenua, working with landowners and working with local communities. And, and another one of the things that we recognised to begin with was that roughly a third of Aotearoa New Zealand is in the conservation estate, around 30% of the country. Less than 10% of that has any kind of pest control. So almost by default, uh, it's up to us, as in the the, the, um, the people that occupy the other 70% of the country, uh, to look after the, these um, these treasures, these taonga going forward. Um, and I guess what a network like this shows, as well as the work of James and all the other um, predator-free projects throughout the country, is we're showing what can be done when we work together. Um, and together, the projects removed uh, around a thousand stoats uh, across the um, nearly five years um, of mahi. And last year, we met the technical requirements to return kiwi, uh, and we were issued with a permit for 250 uh, kiwi nui, North Island brown kiwi, uh, over the next six years. Um, the first 13 arrived in 
November last year, and we're going to watch a short video at the end uh, showing that arrival. Um, and last week we had, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we, we had another 50 birds uh, join them. So there's uh, 63, we, we, I guess we call them our ex expeditionary force of, of returning Kiwi um, out on those western hills. Um, and the, the critical partners in the project have been um, the, the over 100 landowners um, that you can see who've allowed uh, the project permission to, to have traps on their land, uh, Iwi Mana Whenua, um, who've, who've supported the project since it hatched, and the, um, the local communities that have been uh, so passionate, especially Makara, um, uh, behind and getting behind the project. So um, these things don't uh, come for free <laughs> in terms of Putia. So um, we were one of the first six projects along with Predator Free Wellington um, funded by Predator Free 2050 Limited, and that, that's been foundational. Um, and what we're aiming to do is ultimately um, is remove stoats entirely from that southwest corner, um, which has never been done on the mainland before. So it's, a, it, it's an ambitious goal of, of the project. Um, and it, it's a recognition really that that I guess um, you know stoats are really impressive, beautiful animals. They're, they're, a, they're a string of muscle. They're kind of like Usain bolts of, uh, of, the, um, of the animal world. But they don't belong here, and and kiwi do, and this is the this is the only home for kiwi. So, um, it's our responsibility really for looking after that home. Um, yeah, and I wanted to also acknowledge uh, some local philanthropists that have supported the project: uh, Wellington Community Fund, Doc, Save the Kiwi, uh, our, uh, especially the work of Zealandia, uh, our mates Predator Free Wellington, and both councils uh, and all the folks uh, trapping in their reserves and backyards. Um, we are in the midst of, um, of a resurgence in Wellington that's probably globally significant, I reckon, in terms of restoring um, Tataio and biodiversity to our, to our uh, city. Um, my, I need to get this right, my mum will always tell me off I get to one or, or, two, or too many greats, but my great, 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 great grandparents um, are uh, buried uh, up at Karori Cemetery and uh, Bolton Cemetery. And sometimes I reflect that, you know, they would have heard Kiwi at dusk. They would have heard Kōkāko in the morning. Um, the hill above the Prime Minister's house is called Pai Huia, um, the, the place where the, the ridge of the Huia. Um, the old name for Mount Koko is, is Tarikaka, the place where the Kaka um, rest. Um, and, you know, even in the 1870s, you could go to the butchers and get weka and kaka along with, you know, your, your chicken and and and, um, and uh, cattle beasts. But by the time I grew up in Johnsonville uh, in the 1990s, um, as a teenager, my experience was blackbirds, sparrows and, and, and possums at night. So um, things had changed um, remarkably for the worse, I guess. <laughs> and... <laughs> and um, my kids now in Newtown are uh, growing up and hearing Tui, uh, Kaka, Kariria, the falcon every morning. And we've recently had uh, a pair of Kiriru for the first time in the, the 15 years or so uh, that, that we've lived in the suburbs. So, like I said, yeah, we're, we're in Wellington, we're in the midst of something that's quite profound. And we're only just getting to grips with, uh, with what's happened, why it's happened, and, and what it means uh, for us as, as a people going forward. Um, and I guess restoring Kiwi was was uh, you know Kaka Kariria Kereru was the was the restoration of a pretty special K uh, in in um, in that suite of um, of, of birds. Um, one of the things we reflect on is that if we exile these Taonga to uh, islands and behind zoo fences, um, we risk losing the connection with them that that's required to to be, to be guardians of them and ensure their survival. Um, They'll, they'll effectively become museum pieces and nature's not somewhere that we go that you go to uh, that you sh that you should have to pay to access um, or learn about it Te Papa even though that you know that's a, a fantastic place to visit um, it's not something that's in in Fiordland it's something that we're intrinsically connected to um, they are us and whether that's from a te ao Māori perspective uh, or even um, in our, our identity as, as New Zealanders. You know, we have our TUI Music Awards. We have our, um, our film effects company in Wellington is called Weta Effects. Um, when we go overseas, we, we're known as Kiwi. It's, um, yeah, the, these things are a, a really important part of our identity and sense of belonging here. Um, 
So our vision, I guess, as a project is to um, is to have kiwi in our in our backyards, um, in our gullies and paddocks and and um, uh, trails. Probably the first place uh, where kiwi will be experienced in, in coming months will be um, the Karori Golf Course. <laughs> and, oh, wow! Um, <laughs> and uh, and we'd like to think that that as this animal will become heard and experienced and um, and cared for. Um, and I guess um, as predation has removed kiwi from our experience, we've, we've lost connection with the spirit of, of an animal that has gifted us so much in terms of our identity. Um, sometimes we've reflected that, you know, more tourists have probably seen kiwi in the wild than, than us as people who live here. Um, and these are, you know, when you spend time with kiwi in the wild, um, you, you understand, you get to understand them as, as, you know, tough, feisty, resilient um, animals. They've got, They've got to show that photo of Anahira again, that, um, you know, big fighting claws. Um, as Wellingtonians, I think, uh, might maybe an apt comparison to make is that they've got a fiend like Adi Savia. Uh, <laughs> they're, um, you know, some of the guys on our team, like Jeff, you can see here, and Pete, their arms are covered in scratches from from um, from a career of uh, of handling and, and, and looking after Kiwi. Um, you know, you don't name your, your rugby league team um, after a, a, you don't name your armed forces after a fantail. <laughs> I guess that, you know, these animals are are quite tough and resilient um, and they're impressively adaptable. They can live from uh, pine forest to pasture, from from sand to uh, from sand dunes to the snow. So cutting cutting it. Cutting, cutting through uh, the, the story, they've they've gifted us the strength of identity, and and in a way we haven't really recognised the licence fee um, on on um, on what they've gifted us. And one of our uh, volunteers, uh, Ted Smith, ninety five year old Ted Smith, um, one of the founders of the the Macrocarpas, he likes to say that if we can't look after the animal that um, has gifted us our name, we deserve to be renamed idiots. <laughs> And and I think that's um, that's probably one of the driving propositions of the project, and I think ultimately, um, you know, if you think about kiwi as a as a Trojan manu or a Trojan bird, that's true of our relationship uh, with Tataio, with nature in general. So, um, yeah, by restoring kiwi to the backyard of of our capital city, we will make a significant contribution uh, to saving our symbol in Taonga. Uh, the hills west of Wellington are by far the biggest new addition of um, pest-controlled whenua to kiwi conservation. And it's a very um, special uh, and timely collaboration with the kiwi kohanga that Save the Kiwi has been growing up at Mangatauturi. So within that uh, fenced environment, they're now at a point where um, the breeding within the, in that environment is going so well they, that they need to find sites uh, in the wild, unfenced, that have appropriate pest control, uh, to to restore kiwi to the places where they where they've you know lived for for eighty million years since since Tane, and um, and uh, so we are um, one of those first projects that's um, that's able to really start delivering on that vision of shifting conservation from uh, I guess an intensive care or ambulance at the bottom of the cliff uh, through to how do we create conditions for abundance at scale uh, in the wild alongside people. Um, and I guess uh, it's worth, oh, sorry, I'm just looking through the slides. So these are some of our, um, yeah, those key partners, landowners, uh, community, iwi. Uh, this was the first release site um, in uh, Tawa Hill on Te Rafferty Station. And uh, one of the things <coughs> that's worth pointing out is, you know, on the boxes, we've got handle with care. And, and I think, there's a gift uh, that has been delivered to the people of Wellington, and these kiwi are now are now the under the custodian or, or guardianship of the people of Wellington, and it's also a challenge. Um, you know, as it says on those boxes, we must handle them with care, and we've done our best to provide the foundations for a safe place to sit for kiwi, a nohoanga. Um, and the challenge really is ours now to um, step up and, and, and be guardians, to keep those traps set, uh, report sightings, uh, be aware of uh, our cars on, on the roads at night now that Kiwi will start to establish and be in areas uh, closer to people. Um, and, you know, as we said in some ways uh, a, a couple of weeks ago in, in November, this is really the end of the beginning for, for this mission. Um, in some ways, it's, it's, it's just the start line.
Um, but um, one thing we have to acknowledge um, is that these 63 Kiwi are a milestone of, of collective effort. Um, and if those partners that we've looked at, Iwi Mana Whenua, uh, the over 100 landowners that have supported the project and, and those local communities show that we can look after Kiwi together, then the Kiwi will look after us. Um, and I hope that um, in coming years, uh, when we go to sleep at night and we're generating letters to the editor complaining about um, Kiwi keeping them awake, <laughs> um, that that we reflect on that as a kind of a collective um, cheers for, for what we've delivered each other. So uh, one of our um, uh, partners in the project, Therese, uh, who's a kaitiaki ranger at Zelandia, um, when we um, went to Makara school and the, the, uh, very early on, this would have been 2017, uh, 2018, the kids came up with, uh, with a sign, a, a kind of gang sign for, for supporting the Kiwi. And it was, uh, it was for the big fighting claws. And um, we caught up uh, with Teresa at, at, at Zelandia and, and, and we talked about how the kids had come up with this sign. And Teresa mentioned that in, in, in sign language, that also is the W for Wellington. Uh, but in sign language, it's the W. It's like this in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I'm not sure if it will come across on the screen, but the sign for Kiwi is uh, is for the long beak. So it's, yeah, I thought worth ending on, on Go Kiwi, I guess. Fantastic. Um, shall we hit your wonderful video? And Sounds great. Okay, brilliant um, presentation, Paul. Fantastic. And we've got this great video I'm going to play to everyone now. Here we go. It's gifted us this night. You need to tell me what. Or what? You need to tell me what. Tell me what. My father is not here. What is it? You don't want to go.
Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Goodness gracious. Uh, and the logo is fantastic, Paul. It really is tremendous. Yeah, it's, it's um, um, yeah, the support for the community has just been incredible, really. Um, just one quick question that is really relevant, I think, um, and the people are sending great comments in of how phenomenal it is and how well that uh, video captures it all. Um, B just asks, um, what do you think of the biggest threats to the Kiwi that have been released already? Um, dogs, of course, I imagine are a problem. Um, yep. If, but anything else? Uh, I think, um, so all the Kiwi that have been released are either uh, sub-adult or adults, so um, they're big enough to fight off stoats and, and, and weasels and possums and cats, uh, so that's correct. Probably the biggest threat for those adult Kiwi will, will be dog control, but the um, we've had over 100 dogs in the, uh, so where the Kiwi have been released is, is in the Te Rafferty station on the wind farm, um, and um, We've had over 100 dogs in that community, so Makara Village, South Makara Road, put through Kiwi avoidance training. As Kiwi establish in that relatively remote area and start to disperse closer to uh, the city, uh, we'll, we'll have to continue working with those communities around uh, Kiwi awareness, I guess. So um, keep your dog in at night, um, dog on a lead where it should be, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's the, it's the same behaviours you'd have to... to so your dog doesn't eat your neighbor's chook. So your um, so your dog doesn't harass kids and things. So it's basically just been a you know a good dog owner. And um, and again, the the community support has been so fantastic that we're in um, they're in good hands out there um, out in the southwest. And 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 part of our challenge as the Kiwi grow and end up on those edges of the city, we'll be growing a I guess a city of Kiwi guardians. So um, and you know we're not un unaware of the challenge, um, but. Wellington's up for it, I guess, is the, um, the, the, the best way of describing it. Um, and ultimately, the, what we're aiming for is a, is a um, uh, growing Kiwi population. So the numbers of stoats out there are, are incredibly low. And we, we've given them the best shot that they can in the wild to, um, to grow that population. Um, you know, nature involves life and death. We are going to lose... Uh, some chicks, and um, but we, we're confident we're providing them um, a, a suitable environment environment to have a yeah thriving large scale uh, population of kiwi in the backyard of Wellington. Yeah, amazing, Paul. Thank you. Um, you present it so well, and you're the right man for the job. Right there, I can see you know you can hear and feel the passion in your voice and how, how you explain things. Well, it's really cool the way you can do that. So you know, thank I guess you. The, uh, before we hand over to James, and um, it, there's some I wasn't I wasn't prepared for how um, the when those birds arrived in November, and then we saw it again at Pipitia Marae, and then at Makara Village Hall uh, a week ago. There is something quite profound about the connection between people and between us and Kiwi. Uh, we've had this special connection with this with this animal since people first came here, and um, it's been a bird that whether you're talking about, you know, grizzled old farmers or, or an old kuia, all the way through to those makara school kids. Um, it, it wasn't just the onions and the sausages that were, were uh, and the hot dogs that were giving watery eyes. Like there's yeah, something special about that connection. Yeah, I agree. It's great. And uh, so beautiful to see your project. I'm going to send you off to the green room for a minute because James has joined us and we'll see you back at the end if there are any extra questions for you before the end of this webinar. Thanks again, Paul. Great to have Thanks, you mate. here tonight. Brilliant. Um, James, thank you. Um, can you just uh, please, <laughs> um, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us a, a wee bit about you as well before we move in. Yeah, kia ora tato. Um, so my name is James Wilcox and I'm the project director for a wee project called Predator Free Wellington. And our aim is to eradicate every last rat, stoat, possum, and weasel from Wellington City and its surrounds, 30,000 hectares. And I am talking today about a concept called social license to operate and the impact on conservation. Great. I'm going to ch uh, chuck you across to the little box over there, and I'm going to put your presentation on, and away you go. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, kia ora, everyone. So I wanted to start with this slide because that concept of social license to operate, it really isn't a license at all in, in our mind. It means a general acceptance of methods, and, and that's great. That's really cool. It'll, it'll enable us to get some stuff done. But 
it feels like doing two communities. So it feels like, you know, it, it's seeking a permit to go and do something to people in their homes, in their schools, in their communities. And as we started our journey with Predator Free Wellington, we realized pretty quickly that we were going to need to aim so much higher than just a social license to operate. So I just thought as, as part of this corridor, I'd reflect a little bit on our on our journey in, in terms of the city, bearing in mind that we don't want to be here forever. Predator Free Wellington, we want to get the job done and then we want to hand it back to the people and we think that's where it belongs. So when we started out this crazy kind of idea of, of eradicating all of those target species, we picked Miramar as the first step. And so what that meant for us is that we needed to get 12,000 traps and bait stations in an area the size of 1,000 hectares. So in Kiwi speak, there is 12 lethal devices, either big traps or bait stations in an area the size of a rugby field. So we are operating everywhere, the same density across that whole peninsula, independently of the land tenure, who lives there, who works there, whether it's a school. So we figured out pretty quickly that we were going to have to completely change the way we went around this about this conservation work. We needed over 3,000 individual permissions to get those traps and bait stations into people's properties that gave us a chance of eradicating our target species. So what we did is we went around and we knocked on doors for six months. We had a team of engagement field officers who would have had thousands of cups of tea, thousands of conversations to actually figure out what was going on for people in their lives and how we could become relevant to them. So we, start, we, we realized really quickly that actually this project was about affecting social outcomes through the medium of conservation. When we started out, we thought we wanted permission to go into people's backyards, to their businesses, and do our work. What we really realized is that actually we were going to become part of their lives, and that is a really different proposition altogether. And what I mean by that is these are the tools of our trade, right? So they're pretty pretty intimidating looking, looking weapons of destruction. They contain toxin for rats, or they're big traps orientated for mustard lids. And we have that kind of density everywhere. We're not giving out free ice creams, right? We're asking, can we put this in your backyard, in your school, in your business? But the kicker was, can we come back and visit that every single week until the job's done? And that's a really different proposition. In a city like Wellington, it's probably no surprise that saving the birds or weeding the marginal strip or... Um, native restoration planting is not top of the list for everyone. You know, some households, a lot of households, they're busy trying to put a feed on the table and a roof over their family's heads. So the conservation, the birds in this case, all of our native species was well down the list. So we had to figure out what was the why for people. If we couldn't answer the why, then we weren't going to get any, any movement forward with our project. So we had to go and figure this out in all sorts of different contexts. And that's why Miramar is so amazing is because it's like a small city unto itself. It has really high socioeconomic deprivation scores, incredibly low socioeconomic deprivation scores. And as our team started to canvas this landscape, we found that while for some people it might be bringing the birds back to support our work, for others they just couldn't sleep at night because they had rats crawling around in their hot water cupboard or in the ceiling. For other people, it was about health concerns of, you know, perhaps catching leptospirosis of rats or all of those different things. Whatever the reason was, it didn't matter. We just needed to figure out the why for people and then we're able to proceed. And so the question of answering the why really led us to this place around give and take, right? This is a relationship of reciprocity. And if you accept that, then you're definitely going to go about your work, your work differently. We had to build trust. We had to build huge amounts of trust with these thousands and thousands of people on Miramar and now 60, 70,000 people in the next phase more broadly in the city. Building trust is a really, really hard thing to do and it's so easily undone. Now our work on Miramar, it's no secret, it's taken a lot longer than we thought. You know, we got rid of the mustard lids, we got rid of the Norway rats, and it's been really, really tricky with the, the ship rats. But the community stayed with us. And I think that's because 
we've enabled them to find their place within this project. We haven't dictated all the terms. We've enabled people to step up in all sorts of different ways. And why I really love this slide is because when you're collaborating in a meaningful way, it can take you to some strange places. So, you know, you look at those photos and think, well, what's that got to do with an eradication? What's that got to do with conservation? You know, there's Daryl, our rat man down in the bottom corner there. He was, uh, you know, spent a bit of time on the wrong side of the tracks, if you like, but he was instrumental in, in getting us access into the Black Power gang pad or getting us access into marginal areas of the community. Over on the right side there, that's an artist called D-Side who's finishing off a mural on a whole set of trap boxes. And those were all given out to students at Vic Uni that were then able to go home with this piece of art. Why is that important? Because that enabled us to connect with a whole different audience. I'm way too old to figure out how to um, how to vibe with students these days. So we needed all of these different factions going on so we could have as much coverage as we could. We sponsor Mirror Marvelous, a fantastic little laneway festival, again, just to connect with new audiences. And then local businesses like Roman there and our local legend, Dan Henry. Roman's from Fix and Fog. They give us thousands and thousands of dollars worth of peanut butter every year, which we use in our traps. Best peanut butter in the world, so at least we know that rats are dining out on gourmet food for their last meal. And then other collaborations with artists. The, the point being... This is about massive impact beyond what we could ever do ourselves. You know, we, we're a pretty small team and 29 of our field staff yelling into the void is one thing, but actually allowing people to step up to find their place and contribute in their own way turned our team into this movement of thousands and thousands of people. So we didn't want to just get permission. We didn't want to just have our social license. We wanted to create a movement where everybody could be part of because we don't want to do this forever. We want to finish this part and then give it back to the people. That's really, really key for us. And it's taken us to some really strange and crazy places, you know, things that as a career conservationist, I never thought we'd be doing, but boy, it's been pretty amazing, pretty amazing to see how people are able to step up and lead in this space. So when I think about the future of restoration mahi for our city, you know, I totally took the words of Paul in his presentation before, that nature doesn't belong on offshore islands, right? It has to be relevant. It has to be part of our lives. And these photos here are of a, um, of a, a collaboration we did with a whole lot of schools on Miramar Peninsula where we got them to tell us what their vision for the future was, right? And that should matter because this is what this is all about, right? It is about handing back an environment to the next generation that isn't half trashed for the very, very first time. And it was amazing to see their voices come through in their art and the paper mache native species they hope to see come back. You know, the sign saying a litter free sea tomb, stories about birds being able to transverse a, a parallel universe. All of that sort of thing was, was just incredible. And so I guess, for us, seeing seeing those voices come to the fore, being able to ensure that that there's efficacy is so important in, in that idea of social license and building trust. So enabling people to do something really easy in their backyard that then links them to their community, links them to their neighborhood, links them to their city is massive. And considering the whole kind of picture of environmental decline at once, it's just, it's just too big for people. But that simple thing by demonstrating that people can find their place, they can do something simple and it will make a difference is really, really key. And so for us, that was about giving up control as well. And that's quite a confronting thing in this space. It can be quite challenging to say, actually, we're going to allow people to find their voice because we want to enable them. We want them to be leaders in this space. And so that's what we did. And so from that vision of the future for all of these, these school kids, and that bottom shot there is um, some students from the Kura and Situn, who were again taking us for a walk around Miramar, around Situn, and articulating their vision for the future. And this is what we're seeing in terms of that new future. And the reason why I wanted to show that slide is because there's two different types of reporting there, right? So one is on the left-hand side, that's all of our camera data coming in. So we have over 350 cameras on Miramar Peninsula, roughly one every hectare. We get the rats to zero, get the mustelids to zero, and then we start seeing these incredible native species returning, like kakariki on, on the peninsula, or the korora, little blue penguins, all of the stuff going on. 
But what's really, really amazing on the right is that those are all the stories coming in from community and what they're seeing in their city. And you kind of ask yourself, well, which is the more powerful proposition? Is it is it predator-free Wellington's detection data? No, it's not. It's all of those stories on the right-hand side and where people are contributing their own view, what it means to them, how they've been involved, and the difference it makes to them in their lives. So our, our WE project, Predator Free Wellington, we are just one small part of ecological restoration journey of this city. You know, you're all involved. Everyone in the audience out there listening in is doing incredible work. So massive total to you. Your efforts are incredible. It's all part of this amazing change that Paul referred to, this amazing journey that we're on. And for our small part of, of, of everything in terms of Predator Free Wellington, as we move through the city, we're seeing more and more people from all sorts of diverse backgrounds really wanting to step up and define the kind of city that they want to live in. And I think it's so important to acknowledge that, so important to allow people to find their space and contribute in whatever way that they want to. Sure, we've got tens of thousands of backyard trappers, but we've got lots of artists, lots of business owners, lots of people that want to do the replanting afterwards, lots of people that want to help with the weeding because we now know that if we've got Cape Ivy in an area, we're going to have rats. So all of these different pieces all fit together. And I think that's really key. It also then helps inform the next piece of work. So from contributing to a project in your backyard, then we're seeing this genuine desire to do the next thing. So the rat traps have gone silent. What do we do now? Can we get on with perhaps weeding in one of the reserves or native tree planting? That stuff is really important and it's part of this really growing consciousness that we've got in the city of people wanting to collaborate, people wanting to get behind a vision and actually do stuff together. I think that's really important. And that's a world away from social license, right? It's a world away from asking for permission to do something. If you're prepared to invest in building trust, if you're prepared to accept that it's about reciprocity and you're able to allow people to find their place and whatever your project is and whatever you're trying to do, that is far greater impact than a simple conservation project trying to eradicate and introduce predators from the city. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for everything you do again. And let's crack on with turning this massive ship around eh, in Wellington City. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing. You both are just fantastic at presenting the vision. Do you both see the same future? We must get together occasionally, you guys, and have a beer. Well, we used Do to be you... together, Nick. We, we were in an arranged... We were married once. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're uh, so... As, absolutely... as projects, uh, um, <laughs> Predator Free Wellington and Capital Kiwi were, were uh, both the... When Predator Free 2050 Limited first were looking for the landscape scale projects and the pieces of the jigsaw that were going to lead to our the country being able to achieve this stuff they saw uh, such strength in both propositions that they asked us to put in a combined um pitch for wellington really and um so yes we're um we're on the same page it's um in a way i think yeah to fully tackle um um all of um james's presentation it's a shift from being i guess passively proud in um in the fact that we've got two in our back gardens that we've got um moka moka on your letterbox in miramar um that's the 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 uh rokawa geckos um to active guardianship and i think that's the journey we're in the midst of and you know for for my for my daughters to grow up and say dad it's just a kaka <laughs> like that's a <laughs> phenomenal change that's already happened and we're just we're scratching the surface of that journey, I think, and and there, it really is, um, yeah, built on trust, built on empowering people, um, and shifting nature from something that's a nice to have to a part of who we are, and and we have that intrinsic connection to it. Like we, you know, um, we're not our national team is we're not going to they're not going to be the Kiwis the rugby league team is not going to be renamed the Stoats or the Possums, right? We're not going to allow that to happen, and it's. Um, it's really empowering us as as people to to be better guardians of um of of um Titao. I see Nigel, who's also a bit of a legend from Old Man's Beards, uh, giving you the big ups for a great presentation. But he said, thinking about Kiwi coming from the west and predator free from the east, 
I can't wait till it all comes together. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've often joked, like with James and and Dan uh, from Miramar, that we'll meet at Parliament in twenty thirty. You can bring a Kotoa, and we'll bring a Kiwi, and um, yeah, that's right. It, it'll it'll be a um, different sort of parliamentary parliamentary occupation. Exactly. <laughs> Throughout, the, oh yeah, go for it. Sorry, James. I was just going to say, I think probably for both of us over those occasional beers when we do catch up. It's that journey through humanity which has been so, so incredibly humbling and realising that we don't own any of this. We are just part of something that's far, far bigger. And that is just incredible. Like the, the social outcomes that we're seeing and then, you know, hopefully translating into econ economic outcomes from the city is just so incredible. And that's what tells us that it's so important to have these native species around us. Like Paul said, they are us, we are them. It doesn't exist on an offshore island where no one can go to or, or very few people. And that, I think, yeah, I mean, we've reflected on that together a lot, uh, just just how humbling it is with people wanting to step up and be part of it, not being done to. It, it's, it's amazing, man. Yeah, and and you know, Nick, we we're in um we're in quite we're in quite divisive times, and 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 it's it's remarkable how apolitical these things are. Um, that are that we're, that we're looking after. It's um, you know whether you're red, you're blue, you're um, you're green, you're purple. Um, no one's going to disagree that we should look after Kiwi. <laughs> it's um, yeah. and we saw this with um, you know we and, and we saw this with uh, with our mate in uh, behind bars in in, in Miami uh, over the past week. It's um, and and I think what you know with, whether it's um, blitzing old man's beard like Nigel is in. Um, and doing a fantastic job. Um, it's all those groups throughout Wellington, and with the four-wheel drivers, the mountain bikers, the, um, the the you know those groups looking after the reserves in the backyards. It's um, it's about in some ways you know these projects aren't about conservation; they're about community. We brought in Hink because Hink, for as you you know each other very well, you guys I know. But <laughs> Hink, um, you had a great question there. Can you just go to the boys again with it? Uh, oh, <laughs> I was sort of just like on the on the down low. Uh, well, I was I was just saying, look, I, I, I'm trapping currently in Whitby in, in Porirua, and you know, look, I'm hearing about Free Free Wellington, Capital Kiwi, amazing projects, um, and we've got a few schools involved, and we, we're engaging with them, but. It, like if if I'm if I'm a volunteer group trapping, kind of you know a little bit further away. Like what kind of messages have you got for those volunteer groups? Um, and you know, is there something that they can do to take it to the next level for for themselves? Hundred yeah. percent, mate. Of course, of course. I I would say, I mean, talking to groups all around the country about setting that vision because once you've set a vision, then you've got everybody connected on a journey together. And, and a vision can and should be lofty, and it might take some time. But, you know, look where Predator Free Wellington started and Capital Kiwi started. They were, they were not dissimilar, mate. It was it was a few crazy ideas and, and, and a ragtag mob of people. And, and it's just about you've still got in Porirua and Whitby, you've got great communities there. You've got people. So I would say anything's possible as long as you've got people. It's finding that why. Why do people, why Why should they care? Why should they be involved? And how can they be involved? Enabling that to happen, you'd be pretty surprised what, what can occur, mate. Oh, awesome. Thanks, James. And I think in everyone's backyard, there'll be, you know, we like to harp on about the Kaka in Wellington. You know, they're a bit like us. They're a bit loud. They're a bit um, <laughs> um, bullshy. They're like the kind of, you know, the, the bogans coming to town. But um, <laughs> but every community will have, um, will, have, will have special things in their back gardens. You know, I've loved seeing in Miramar, how the um those you know those moko moko those skinks in there in in in, in the letter boxes and weta coming back you know these are these they'll have there'll be coda in people's streams there'll be um there, there'll be things to connect with in every community and you know make those connections and tell that story don't exclude anyone it's um get on with it yeah. <laughs> effectively yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I, was, I was also going to ask, and, and if there are any other questions, I don't want to hog it. Um, but uh, Paul, you spoke about, you know, when you grew up and there were the possums and the sparrows around and your kids now are seeing the, the tui and the, the carrieria. Have you got a like, a like a vision or an idea or like sort of just like in 30 years, 
this is what I would like to see in Wellington. I know where you're pushing me towards, mate. Oh, um, no, no, no. You, don't, you don't have to go there, bro. Just... I, I tell you what, it would be amazing to see Takahe back on uh, on some of our hills on Te Um The you know the, the habitat's prime for them. We've we've made a great start with the with the predator control. Um, that it, it, Takahe, Korkako potentially, but more complicated. But yeah. Um, yeah. Fantastic. And now, how about you, James? Yeah, I think I think definitely the species side of things. But for me, it's strong, resilient communities, mate. We've got strong, resilient, connected communities. Then we, mm. we will survive all of these hardships that are coming at us and these these bigger issues. And mm. we'll actually have a chance at, at turning some of those around. I mean, that's what we're demonstrating in the city now. So that's the hope for me, mate. Oh, fantastic. That's awesome. Also, you guys, I've uh, you must feel the way that this new era uh, of what you're doing is creating pathways for careers for the people of the future, you know, the young ones. Um, you're playing a big role in that. Is that what you're feeling as well as this is all happening throughout the country? The careers are starting to um, just, to, there's more of them, more of them, more things that's, to do. That's, bigger, that's one of the things I'm most proud of, mate. And it's not, again, it's not my work, but seeing seeing these young people come through i just think wow it's almost time for me to step aside because they are <laughs> going to go to places that i've never even imagined we've, we've just got so many incredible stars and you know I've, I've worked in the conservation sector for over 20 years you know in doc and and that workforce was very looked a lot like me actually but older and and seeing the diversity we've got in terms of our team with people from all around the world different skill sets it's just amazing and that being a viable career option now as is, is, is change makers is just incredible man i, I love it it's so yeah. cool and and when we and you know to, to be honest the stereotype when we started was most people thought conservation was something done by someone else uh, like a dock ranger in fiordland and that's now and almost flipped on its head now you've got you know you've got designers uh data geeks um you know gi gis people um uh, musicians, um, yeah, filmmakers, yeah. and and uh, you know, yeah, it's a really Welling Wellington story in lots of ways. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, hey, you guys have been brilliant. I um, I want to thank you very much for uh, all the work you do, and I know Heck does as well. But it's just been great tonight to uh, get that passion and that energy that you put out with uh, no uh, hesitation at all. We know we that you love what you do, and um, but you deserve a break. So I'm going to now uh, ask you to go and have a nice coldie or or maybe a cup of tea um, back to your families. And we do appreciate you so much for giving time up tonight for our webinar. Kilda, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you. very much, thank Paul you. Ward and um, and James Wilcox. Thank you, guys. Hank, two of the legends uh, of the um, of Wellington Predator Free and the work they're doing. Oh, definitely, definitely setting the scene for uh, a transformation in Wellington and uh, just, you know, uh, amazing for me to work with them on a more regular basis. But um, uh, I think they they touch so many uh, people's lives and there's so many people part of the journey. Um, uh, it's it's just a fantastic opportunity to to do something for nature by uh, being part of those uh, groups uh, and like Fred Free Wellington and Capital Key, but also the wider volunteer uh, community. Yeah, well, we've had um, an amazing time with these uh, webinars over the last, well, yes. um, you know, six nights. I just feel so much more educated on what people are doing and the way that they shared with me and others that watch the webinars. I think that was gold, absolutely gold for me. Oh, definitely. Thanks very much, Nick, for uh, for hosting and uh, Bryony for doing all the organisation in the background. Um, I just really had the, the benefit of coming along and, and saying a few words. It's It's been absolutely fantastic to have all the presenters come share their amazing stories um, and uh, and everybody that's tuned in. Thank you very much for, for coming and making time to listen to these. Um, I think there were some really interesting things and I'm, I hope that you, you took something away um, and that it's really relevant for where you're, uh, you're volunteering in your spaces. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, if you're okay, I'm going to leave the last words to you, the karakia, to take us out. It's been a privilege. Hink, thanks very much, mate. Kia ora. Uh, mā te kura tayo, tēnei kura nui, tēnei kura roa, kia horohia te Māori, ora ki, 
runga ite mata o te whenua, uh, ka rongo te po, ka rongo te ao, fiti, fiti, uh, tau mai te mauri, humie, huie, taikie. It is through the determination of the taio that this all-encompassing and enduring living force be far-reaching across the landscape, resounding through the night and the sorry, end the day, uh, enlighten and bring forth balance, gathering people together as one. Kia ora, everybody. Kia ora. Thank you, everybody. See you again. Bye-bye.